been working on this JavaScript debugger, which I think a lot of you have even seen so far already. It's called Theseus. And um, one of the things that I've worked hard on recently has get, been getting it to work on brackets itself. So you can use this debugger to open a second window of brackets and then do whatever you do, it is you do with debuggers um, <laughs> using my tool in addition to or, um, the other tools that you already have. And so I want, today I basically wanted to introduce anyone that's not already familiar with to the, um, CCS just really quickly and then show how it's useful inside of brackets itself and how to, how to get it set up so that's working on your computer. And then finally, um, have any questions or discussion or anything about that. And so hopefully it's, 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 it's fairly short. I mostly just want to give introduction and get some people using it and trying it out. So that's the goal. And so I first want to start off with just a really simple example of CCS. This is running on not brackets. Yes, yeah, running on not brackets, um, where I've got this Node.js server, and I'm going to put CCS into proxy mode and load up the index.html file. And I fix the URL. Now, if that worked, then what I have here is an HTML file that is loaded using live development inside of this uh, second this Chrome window. And it also has an embedded script tag, which CCS has recognized and instrumented so that everything that happens inside of this script is, is being collected um, so that you can debug it. And I can do, watch that sort of code execute by, let's say that I submit this form, then I can see that my quick handler over here was clicked, and then my save was called, and then it called the, the done handler um, for the promise for posting to the server, and then eventually it um, three seconds later, it hid that status window that popped up. And I can just do that again. We can see saving, error, oh my god. <laughs> and then three seconds later, hide the status thing over here. Uh, so what these allows you to do is just have this code coverage of all your code all the time. So you can see it executing and see how many times these functions have been called. And do things like if I click on this function, I can see that um, I can get this log of every time that's been called and check out the return values that it had. Um, and I can go over here to the save um, save one and see like, check out what arguments it was given. And then also I can click on each of these done and failure handlers for the promises, and then I get a log of all of those functions together. So I can see which calls to save had the done callback call, called and which calls to save had the fail callback called. And, and it's actually having to do some magic there to figure out that that caused that because those, yeah. those aren't in the same call stack. It was an asynchronous. Right. Yep. Um, I can actually check out the, the backtrace here and see that it, it's um, this was called from some kind of framework code, not jQuery most likely, um, and not directly from the save. But since it was wrapped inside of the closure of the, the parent function, I can tie that back together. So you get this call uh, okay. tree here um, of all of, the, all of the nested function calls and all of the direct calls as well, which is, as you can imagine, a little bit easier to, to capture. Um, for example, this, fu this function here calls save and get data directly, and of course, that call tree also makes sense. And you'll see those in the backtrace of like save. Yeah, so when I say the get data backtrace, I can see that it's called directly from the click handler. This is, this is pretty much everything that DCS does. Except the events. Except the events. So um, um, the events bar is down here where it's it's aggregating several different types of application events and putting them all into this bar and showing you how many times they've occurred. And all these events down here are actually coming from the server, which I've also instrumented. So server.js is that Node.js application running in the background. And I can watch all of those requests come in. Or you can see that there's this, this set time out here every time it gets a request. And let me just disable this program. And then uh, 1.5 seconds later, it sends a response. And so we can do all the same things that we did over there and like get the call tree and inspect all these arguments. They check out the request objects, things like that. And all that's working nice and pretty. But the reason I wanted to um, explain that is because this console.log is actually coming from server.js on line 28, which is this listing on port 3000 down here. So what it's doing is taking all those console.logs and instead of, instead of printing them to the console, it's actually aggregating them inside of CCS. They can, Clicking on this is essentially looking at the terminal or opening the, the web inspector or whatever it is that you usually do to look at those messages. It's also printing those things, and you can also. 
That's true. Inspection. It is also printing those things. So another nice thing about this from the practice perspective is it doesn't conflict with Web Inspector. You can use this and Web Inspector at the same time. And there's Not source map stuff. Because we can't use the live development in this at the same time. Mm -hmm. But you can use well anyway. True. Yeah, I'll get to that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> For sure. Um, and, and so another thing that's going on inside of this is that there are event emitters somewhere inside of the Node.js program. And so I've, I've wrapped all the event emitters so that whenever anything in the application anywhere emits an event, I'll capture its name and anything that was called as a, as a result of it and make it so that if you click that thing down here, then you'll get this log of all the things that happened. And that, I think, is all of these is, as far as I can remember. And right now, the client and the server, we don't trace stuff between those currently. Yeah, that's right. So if I put a, if I add the, the request handler from the server, and then I also add the, I guess, the AJAX call making function over here, then you'll see them both together in the same log, and they're interleaved that's pretty right. accurately. Yeah, because it's the same time time yeah. Um But it's not, it's not nesting them in the call tree yet, because I haven't finished the code for tying the request and response and handlers and things like that. It's not impossible, but... Even if it's not there, it's really useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From here, you can already see like what data was coming in or what was being sent, and then inspect that the data is also being received from the server correctly. So, this is in a nutshell. And now I can also do all of that same stuff with brackets, assuming that the demo gods like me. What I've done is I've added a menu item here called debug brackets with DCS, and given it is really handy hotkey. So it's just like the one for the web inspector, except it's T instead of I. Four T's over. So what this has done is it's actually opened a second brackets window um, using the, the generic window open index.html command. And then it's, it immediately tries to connect to it with the web inspector, or the, yeah, the web inspector protocol, and then immediately redirects it to my proxy server so that instead of loading the bland brackets, it's actually instrumenting everything that happens inside of brackets. And then it's got the web developer connection um, open up, so we can now see over here. Whoops, I should open bracket source code. So I'm looking at document.js right now, and you can see that everything was great for a while, and then things started to light up as brackets opened up the first document over here. And so we can surf through document.js and see things like uh, refresh text was called. So if some other things weren't called, get line was called 36 times, which probably more now, 50 lines. So it looks like any time it needs to load a new line for code mirror, it's calling the get line function. Um, That's probably something else, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's probably something else. That is what it's calling. Actually, can you <laughs> click on it and find out yeah. what it is? Yeah. Backtrace. See. Backtrace. Query preview providers, handle mouse move. What? It is tied to the mouse, but... See, <laughs> <laughs> so we've already done um, something. For hover preview, <laughs> Oh, hover preview, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually the mouse moving around. Yeah. What does the exclamation mark mean in this block entry at the end? Um, this exclamation mark, if, if you hover over it, it'll say that something was had to be truncated from the log oh, okay. for performance reasons. <coughs> that, um, I, have to make, I make a copy of every object so that later on, if I try to access its properties, they can't have been changed or anything like that. Um, but in, to avoid making a deep clone of the entire window object every <laughs> <laughs> for everything, I, I limit the depth and I limit the size to a certain amount. Um, Can you also give back a web worker threat? Sorry? Web worker. Web worker. Um, I don't believe so. I don't know if any of the worker threads that are happening in brackets to test that would Yes, there's uh, one. There uh, are 10 workers in the JavaScript coding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, which file would I look into? Uh, go uh, extension. Yeah. Default. JS uh, JavaScript cooking. Yes, yes, code hints. Oh no, code hints. Okay. Uh, mm, start with JS code hints, and then uh, slash turn hyphen worker should do it. And dish worker. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's not it should have been like instrumented though. It was probably instrumented, but all that does is um, when the file is first executed. It immediately calls out to the tracer object to say this file has just been loaded. So if that's happening in a worker and the communication between the workers doesn't work right. like that, then I guess it's it probably trying to call it work. Right. I'm surprised it's not all great. 
Oh, well, that's, that's the call that I'm talking about. Right. If it never gets that call, then it doesn't know this file exists. The instrumentation code in the worker is trying to call out to the main thread, and it can't because it's not allowed to. Mm -hmm. There is none of that stuff exists in the worker. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, uh, you know, if you, yeah, so one of the things that happened actually was when, when I was first playing with this and, and something about live development wasn't working uh, in the debugged window. And mm -hmm. I'm still having a couple problems with that, but um, we were actually able to use Theseus to figure out where it was dying. <laughs> really? Wow. Because nice. it was exactly that same kind of thing where it's like some asynchronous stuff happened, but you could just kind of go into live development.js and see what got called and what didn't got, get called, and you could uh, kind of pinpoint, oh, well, this wasn't getting called when I tried it or whatever it was. You know? I think I can actually pull that up. Um, even though the bug doesn't exist anymore, I believe, like, I'll still be able to see where it was happening. But the problem was that it was loading all the agents, but then some of them wouldn't finish loading. So uh, yeah. I was actually scrolling through this file and not seeing anything executed up, because... Um, yeah. Welcome to live TV. Thank you. So ignore that gray screen for now. <laughs> A live development started, and so now as we're going through here, we can see all the codes from that queue. I don't know why it's showing me. Maybe not. Call numbers are weird. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Um, so there's somewhere in here, it's, it's calling load all agents or something like that along those lines. Load agents? And then we could see here that it was this creating this all agents promise and doing in parallel for all of the different agents trying to load that agent and then pushing onto the thing. And we could see that there are five calls here, and then there are actually four calls here. Ah. And so all we did had to do was add both of these things to the log, and then see which one didn't have a corresponding done call back here, because huh. the name was actually captured in the outer function, but they uh -huh. they're not inside of this done callback. We could just scroll down that list and see. I think it was the remote agent didn't have a done callback associated with it. Wow. So it actually just took like a couple of seconds of surfing through the file, nice. which is nifty compared to yeah. how much like, time it would have taken with like console.log or anything like or that. Like setting breakpoints or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Especially because a lot of times setting breakpoints actually gets things to work again. <laughs> well, there's that too. <laughs> Although, since we're instrumenting all the JavaScript, you know, it's not clear that that just that's but also changed, changed the behavior of certain kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, my experience with it so far, and I've only used it a little bit, part of the problem is that when it doesn't work in live development, I, mean, I just happen to be working on a live development related feature in it right now. <laughs> so, it's, it's, you know, there's some weird instrumentation that we're doing, and maybe it conflicts around it. But, but um, my feeling when using it was, like, there were definitely times when it's like, oh, yeah, this is totally, like, I, I could just figure out a bug using this. In fact, I already figured out, like, a couple bugs that way that would have been a little tedious to figure out any other way. Um, so I think what would be needed is to get other people on the team trying it out, you know, and seeing where it's helpful, where it's not helpful. Are there ways in which, like, it could be giving you more information? Like right now, it only really gives you information at function boundaries, but maybe there are times when, oh, I'd want to see, like, how something's mutating during a function or things like that, and so, you know, talking about right now. But just getting feedback on, like, is it even useful in its current form yeah. would be really helpful. But, yeah. yeah. And that's exactly the kind of stuff that I'm interested in as well. Um, so one of the things I'd actually ask is if, if you can, if you do start using Theseus, mm -hmm. and there are times when you try to use it and it doesn't work, or you try to use it and it does work, um, if you could make some kind of a note of what your code state was at the time, like if you make a snapshot of the of like the source tree if you have to, or just write down the SHA or whatever, um, because it'd be great if I could come um, talk to you later and then look at that same code and then we can walk through what you're trying to do that that you wish Theseus would have done differently or that Theseus helped out a lot with. But this is actually a research project for me. Yeah. <laughs> the sooner he graduates, the sooner he can start yeah. doing this full time. Exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm hoping to, to talk to you guys at some later point, um, especially if you don't use Theseus at all. Or maybe <laughs> like why? Because, yeah, because I'm really interested in the cases where it breaks down. And so I know a lot of people in the past have been embarrassed, like, I don't really want to talk to you because like, I tried to use it and it didn't work. I'm like, that's, that's a great reason to talk to me because I'd like this to work in all, everywhere, everybody. Um, so I'll be talking to you guys. And I guess I was going to talk a bit about how to get this working, but it really is just you can use the extension loader, a, a registry, and then he sees it in there. And after you install it, it everything is supposed to just work. Yeah. Wow.
Um, it's, it's, it's been available for several months now, but I uploaded a new version this morning that has the brackets debugging feature. Um, one thing that occurred to me is if Theseus is active in the debug window, does that screw something up? Active in the debug. Like, like that might have been one of the things that was screwing me up. Uh, not that I know of. Okay. I mean, I can try it. But I can probably know it was working for you. Yeah, yeah it, it did seem to be working. I didn't check if I was getting the pills in the debug window. Oh, to go back to what Joel was mentioning earlier, you can use, you can still use the web inspector on the main brackets window. Um, but since I'm using the inspector connection on the second window, then you can't make another connection to that. Got it. Um, okay. All of this part should have to still work. If you, if I were to open uh, the inspector onto that second window and then close it again, is there a way to get the thesis to sort of resync itself? I actually haven't found a way to open the web inspector on the second window. It seems to not try to launch at all. Oh, really? Really? I don't, yeah. I could, if I press here. Do you need to do it here. in Chrome? Oh, never mind. Oh, this is what I get. It just immediately says detach from target. Oh. Maybe, oh, it doesn't kick your... And, and it doesn't seem to kick the other connection out. Oh, huh. that's weird. Oh, no, well, but that's not surprising because it's another remote thing that's connected. And you can't connect to multiple remote things. But, but that's how... Because on, like, when you connect with Live Development to Chrome, oh, it's I the native think. one, or the built-in yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then that's the power. So we would, we would probably have to do add some... We would, A, have to add some code to ourselves to say, oh, if you try to open web development, like, tell pieces to shut off. Mm -hmm. And then pieces would also have to have some way of turning back on. If you say, if like, a way of basically saying start the debugger again, but without opening it, like, on this window is what's yeah. opening it. Mm -hmm. Is all the source map stuff in this one? Um, because if no, source map no. stuff is not in yet, then you wouldn't want to use it anyway, because, like, you can't read your code. Oh, because it's all in. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is source map stuff in the work, yeah. which is why I was saying, for just long term, for just general purpose debugging of a website, if you wanted to debug it that way and use that for the live development connection, for instance, then you could still use you know that connection and Web Inspector. Right. Um, the source map stuff seemed to work pretty well last time I saw it. Yeah, uh, it, the stepping through debugger is a little funky, but at least you can see the original source code right. and, mm -hmm. and still set breakpoints even though stepping there's crazy things uh, that are hard to understand. Right. Well, because it's stepping into some wrapper function or enter wrapper yeah. function with some closure that you don't know what that is because some pieces. Yeah. Like. And, I, and I feel like it, if, if I just set all of these source map boundaries just right, it'd figure out that's all just the framework code or something and yeah. I ignore it, but it doesn't do that 100% correctly. Mm -hmm. I have it does look like use... DCS does work inside of this nested window, which uh, scares me a little bit. <laughs> 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 That's pretty crazy. That is pretty yeah. cool. So a couple other things. Um, it does have a way to clear the log now. Is that right? Um, it doesn't quite. Okay. Um, a lot of the code there, but I was there, but I was running into a lot of edge cases, and it's aggravating some other um, oh, okay. more subtle bugs that were in DCS. So it did have a menu option, and it mostly worked with the crazy stuff. Okay. Uh, so I'm working on that, but it's a little tricky. Right. So right now you probably have to just sort of boot it and then do what you want. And like not use it a bunch of times, yeah. otherwise you'll get other companies along stuff. Yeah. The other thing that I mentioned to Tom already that would be really cool is if you could get it to run on the unit test window. Oh yeah. Um, because then you and, yeah. and if, uh, probably you'd want to do it having already started a unit test, or so that it would only run one set of unit tests. Mm -hmm. But um, that might be an interesting thing too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or or oh, and in addition to that, <laughs> feature request was uh, a way to explicitly turn it on and off from within the debug code. Because that's actually what you'd want is you want to be able to say like in this unit test, okay, turn on CCS. Now, like only log starting now and then shut off the log oh, starting yeah. now. Mm -hmm. And that way you could just put that in your one unit test. You could run, you know, the whole yeah. suite, but then yeah. you would just get the info for that one unit test and that would be super useful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good I, idea. I've almost got that, um, but it's, that's also not quite working. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what is the overhead? What's heading with the overhead? The overhead. Um, I think the, the best illustration is probably just watching it start up. This, so this yeah, is, it takes a few seconds. The start time takes roughly 10 seconds or so usually. Yeah. On, on my computer, and so you can compare that to how long it takes brackets to start up. Yeah, um, but I, I didn't find it wasn't terribly. I mean, it was certainly slower, but it wasn't like oh my god, you know. It was like yeah, yeah it's sluggish. Uh, you should put a splash screen in when Theseus is enabled. <laughs> brackets need splash screen, a loading screen. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> There's one. It's just one. <laughs>